Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this installment of the K Perpetua Speaker Series. Today, we will be hearing from Molly Kirkpatrick, and she will be talking about the early period of occupation at the Takanich landing site and surrounding area. Our next one is next Saturday, February 5th, and we'll be hearing from Dr. Rebecca Flitcroft, and she'll be talking about winners and losers, climate and Pacific salmon in coastal Oregon. I'd like to acknowledge that the Cape Perpetua area landscape uh, stretches from Yahats to Florence and, the, and is the traditional territory of the Siletz tribe and the Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayuslaw tribe, and want to acknowledge the tribal governments and their roles historically and today in taking care of these lands. And you can find out more about each of these tribes on their respective websites. A little bit about the Cape Perpetual Collaborative. My name is Tara Du Bois. I'm the communications coordinator for the Collaborative. It's an honor to host and coordinate this series. Um, the Collaborative's vision is to foster conservation and collaboration within local communities for scientific exchange, management, awareness, and stewardship from the land to the sea in and around the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. And our guiding principles are community engagement, leveraging resources and engaging in partnerships. And you can see the logos at the bottom here. These are our founding partners who brought the group together in 20, 2017. But I also like to acknowledge that we have a variety of other uh, partners, local um, cities, nonprofits, businesses that also um, support the collaborative. And without the support of our partners, we couldn't do this work. A little bit about the Marine Reserve. Uh, Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve is the largest of five in Oregon. Um, and in addition to the protected areas to the north and the south, there is some form of protected waters uh, that stretch out three nautical miles into the ocean, stretching from Yahats to Florence. Uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife is the management agency of the Marine Reserves. And you can see some images over here on the right of some photos underwater from their research. If you want to learn more about um, Marine Reserves, you can go to their website at OregonMarineReserves.com. Uh, the Collaborative also hosts a variety of community science within the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve area. Um, many of them are seasonal, um, but we also host monthly beach cleanups. And in addition to this web speaker series, we host a Young Scientist webinar series. That's the second Tuesday of the month, October through April. Um, and something you can join in all year round is the Cape Perpetual BioBlitz series, which is a project you can connect to on the iNaturalist app. And anytime you take observations of um, Met anything really out there that's within the footprint uh, will get uploaded and will help us document biodiversity. And you can find out more about our events and our speakers coming up at our website, capeperpetualcollaborative.org, and like to encourage you to connect with us on our Facebook and our YouTube channel as well. And if you like the work we're doing and you feel inclined to donate, there's a donate button on our website. And you just click that and it'll take you through the steps. And with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Molly Kirkpatrick. She's an archeologist with the Sayus Law National Forest and currently resides along the Oregon coast. She grew up in the Willamette Valley where she obtained her undergrad from the University of Oregon and later her master's from Oregon State University. Her research interests include prehistory of the Pacific Northwest with a focus on geoarchaeology and peopling of the Americas. This lecture will focus on her graduate research during her time at Oregon State University, uh, which she completed in the winter of 2019. And with that, Molly, you can pull your presentation up now. Um, as Molly pulls up her presentation, I wanna let the audience know that you are welcome to put your questions into the chat or the Q&A box. Um, during the presentation as they come up for you. And we will do a Q&A session after Molly's presentation and address those questions. And with that, Molly, it's all yours. Okay, let me set up this presenter view here. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. <laughs> Bear with me for a moment. Um, okay. <clears throat> 
So as Tara said, this is focused on my research. Um, I'm Molly Kirkpatrick. The title of my master's thesis is uh, listed here. It's uh, assessing, assessing the potential for a late, late Pleistocene, early Holocene occupation at the Takanich Landing Site. Uh, located on the Sayusal National Forest within the Oregon Dunes National Recreation Area. So just to give you some perspective of the area we're talking about, um, the Sayusal National Forest outlined in green here, uh, located on the central Oregon coast, um, a little more than a mile uh, away from uh, the Pacific Ocean. Um, and we'll zoom in here. So um, the site that we're going to be talking about today is located here uh, along the western edge of Takanich Lake. Um, you see some dune fields here. Um, this is the current outlet uh, that is Takanich Creek. Uh, here's an aerial image, uh, imagery of, of the site. It's currently a boat landing. I'm sure many of you have uh, visited that area if you're from Florence or the surrounding area. Um, notably, this area is characterized by gently sloped beaches and active dune sheets. Um, and Takanich Lake marks the boundary between the rugged coast range and the migrating dunes that are part of the Oregon Dunes National Recreation Area. So a little bit of history about the site. The Saisa National Forest didn't always own this property. In the 1930s, the property was privately owned and functioned as a fishing resort. Um, previous owners were called a potlatch mound and several artifacts were recovered from the site when it was privately owned. So I've got a few historical photos um, of, the, of the resort here. Um, you see there's some boathouses. The area today looks a lot, a lot different. <clears throat> I'm gonna go back here. So if you were to stand on the existing, uh, existing, I guess it's the dock there, uh, this is what we. This is what you would have seen in the 1930s, but this is obviously an old photo. Here's an overview shot of the resort. Um, again, some boathouses. This is all Takovich Lake, uh, and this is what it currently looks like today. Uh, here's another photo of a boathouse and cabins at the resort. So it was pretty well developed um, at the time, heavily used. Love this photo. Um, very popular recreation spot. Um, here's kind of a roadside attraction. They had a couple bears. Um, you know, I'm not really sure what their function was, but it's kind of a fun. I love these old photos showing what the site was before we acquired it. Actually, I think this is the entrance here uh, as you go in. This is Highway 101. So this photo is actually on the east side of, taken from the east side of 101 looking west. Um, a couple more. So here we've got this like gas yeah, station, the station here and how it looks today. So um, the station would have been here. Obviously it's changed a lot. So what happened after the resort was no more? The, the Forest Service acquired the property in the 1970s with plans to develop the property into a fishing recreation site complete with new toilets, larger parking lots, and fish cleaning stations. Because this was federal property, Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act was implemented, which requires the federal government to take into consideration the effect of federal undertakings on cultural resources. Um, because there was some talk about uh, there being uh, a potlatch mound and artifacts being recovered from the site, uh, they needed to conduct a more thorough research. So there were several phases of uh, Section 106 kind of cultural resource surveys conducted at the site, and they did they did um, find that there was indeed a shell midden. And so a more extensive survey um, and excavation was implemented and that was carried out by Heritage Research and Associates based out of Eugene um, with the primary uh, or principal investigators being uh, Catherine Antopel and Rick Miner. So what did they find? Um, archeological excavations, um, the, the larger archeological excavation that took place at the site uh, began in the early 1980s 
And as I mentioned, it yielded evidence of an occupation starting at around 8,000 years before present with the most intense period of occupation occurring between 5,200 and 3,000 years ago. Um, and the site type was classified as a shell midden village site. So there's some really dense shell midden observed as well as some um, uh, other archaeological, like other cult, uh, other characteristics that uh, uh, <laughs> that was suggestive that people were heavily utilizing the site as a as a village as a village site. Um, so there was a high concentration of shellfish remains, marine mammal bone, various types of stone tools, and bone and antler artifacts. Um, so here. We've got some pictures. There's a little bone, uh, bird bone flute, some of the uh, stone stone tools that were found at the site. Kind of neat. And what's really unique about this is that typically we don't see these kinds of uh, perishable materials uh, in buried contexts along the coast. And I'll go into that a little bit later and why that is. Um, okay, but what what kinds of methods did uh, the researchers use when they conducted this bigger excavation, the, the initial excavation. So um, as I mentioned, there were a couple different phases of archaeological survey conducted. Um, first off, there were two phases of auger probing, which were used to determine the extent of the Sheldman. If you're not familiar with auger probing, this is like, you can almost think of it as like a post hole digger. And so they dig down and basically it's a it's a presence or absence observation. Okay, where do we find the shell midden, which is um, very obvious. It's these comp, you get these compact layers of shell. Um, so anyways, they were using auger probing methods to determine the extent of the site. So once they were able to determine the extent of the site, they opened up 21 by one uh, excavation units in the middle of the mound. And I'll show you a picture of what that looks like in just a moment. And then there were six one by one meter units outside of the mound. And when I say excavation units, you can kind of think of this as the classic block excavation. They're bigger, you know, larger holes. People can actually get in and dig with their trowels. Um, and that gives us a lot of uh, control over, um, you know, when we do uncover things during an excavation, it gives us a, a, a a way to measure and um, more accurate, accurately map where things are um, below the surface. So many of the auger probes uh, were terminated due to sterile sand or because they encountered the water table. So as they were excavating down and they, with the auger probes, they said, okay, yep, we see Sheldon, we see Sheldon say down to even a meter below the surface. And then they either hit a sand layer with no shell or they had to stop because the water table is right there, um, which prevents them from excavating any further below that. So here, uh, let me see if this might help if I zoom in. So here's uh, a map that I made of uh, where all the original auger probes were. That's where all of these dots were. So they really went throughout the site and um, tried to, determine the site boundaries. And you can see the site boundary here in red outlines. When I refer to the mound in this presentation, I'm talking specifically about this area. So even though the site boundaries were defined um, you know, in this larger area, the, the main portion of the site was uh, focused right here in this mound. Um, and then here's a geo-referenced uh, map. I, I basically took the maps that they uh, published in their report and was able to overlay them in um, aerial imagery. So here's here's what the excavation looked like. So we've got these are those one all these each of these squares are one by one meter um, blocks. Okay, so. How were the site boundaries defined? As I said, it was really a presence or absence of shell midden deposits. The site or midden area is approximately 135 by 50 meters. However, construction had limited the densest cultural materials or densest cultural components to a 50 by 35 meter area. And that 50 by 35 meter area is here. So, you know, think back to those pictures I had just 
uh, presented. And I mean, there was some pretty substantial construction along the site. And it's pretty remarkable that, you know, even how, you know, with how many buildings there were and, you know, how much development had uh, occurred at the site, um, we still had a really nice picture, or we, I should say, uh, Heritage Research Associates really, they, have, they were able to focus in here and there was a, a, in context um, deposits that hadn't been disturbed from uh, development, which was pretty remarkable. Um, and just to give you an idea of what Sheldon looks like, this is not from the site itself. This is from a different site um, along the coast. But this kind of gives you an idea of what Sheldon looks like. It's very densely packed with various kinds of uh, funnel and shellfish remains as, and, and uh, as well as uh, artifacts as well. Not always, but um, this is just kind of an example of what the Sheldon looks like. And this is actually at Cape Perpetua, I should say. So here are some photos from the, um, from the original excavation. Uh, here we have a gentleman um, excavating in one of these one by one meter units. We've got some whalebone. Um, and here's uh, somebody taking a, uh, you know, a sample, a controlled sample of each of these layers to get an idea of, you know, what kinds of shellfish were present um, and for botanical studies, things like that. Um, these are some photos of artifacts that were recovered from the site. Um, we have bone and antler wedges, stone adzes. Uh, here's a picture of one of the stone tools, uh, fish vertebrae, and then firecracked rock uh, also we refer to that as FCR, and oftentimes, if you've ever put a river cobble in a in a campfire, uh, they have a tendency to explode, and so it gives it a very uh, characteristic look to it. It has these like it's just it's not just a broken rock, but um, we can tell that they're specifically firecraft um, as a result from cultural activities. Okay, so so what we found? They found some shell midden and some artifacts, but what does this actually tell us? And this is what's really significant about this site. What they found after the excavation and with analysis of the shellfish and faunal remains from the site, we see that there was a very early occup occupation. Um, it wasn't as heavily the site was not heavily as heavily used at this time, but starts around eight thousand years before present. And then over time, the site is continued to be continued continuously used, and with the densest uh, occupation occurring between 5,200 and 3,000 years before present. Um, and what's really unique about this site is that you actually we can actually see that subsistence strategies shift from marine resources, um, so more you know deep deep water. Uh, fish and whale, um, and then it kind of transitions into this uh, shifts from marine resources to estuarine resources, and then abruptly stops after 3,000 years before present. And actually, I guess I should say, we have fresh or marine resources uh, later or in the early stages of occupation, and then there's a slow shift towards freshwater resources through time. So what does that what does that tell us? I, I mean, so what? You know, and it, it, if you've ever spent any time on Oregon Dunes National Recreation Area, you see these massive dune sheets. Um, and what this the subsistence strategies like? What? How does that reflect the changing environment? Um, this actually correlates really well to the development of the freshwater lake, which was made by migrating dunes. And so um, I've got a little, uh, let's see here, make this animation work, just to give you a perspective. So at one point there was just Tackenich had, it was a uh, Tackenich Creek had open flow out to the Pacific Ocean. And as we see the emergence of the dunes starting at around, Five, that 6,000 years, the dunes start to come in, blocking off the creek and basically damming it, creating this freshwater lake. 
And now since the mouth has changed from its original lo uh, location and has now incised through the dunes elsewhere. So what's pretty remarkable about the site is that the subsistence strategies show that people were adapting to a changing environment. So when the dunes start to come in, those, those fresh uh, marine resources were no longer readily accessible. And so you see this transition from the marine and estuary resources into freshwater resources as this had turned into a freshwater lake. So you, um, you think back of where the site's located, well, you know, it's somewhere basically around here. So they're more focused on freshwater resources after around, you know, 5,000, 3,000 years, it's not very, you know, refined. We're thinking in a little broader time scale, but that's pretty neat. And if you have ever, ever read um, Kurt Peterson, who has done a lot of research on the dunes and um, timing of dune emergence along the coast, uh, he, he often references Pakenich, uh the research done by Heritage Research Associates at Takmich. So it, they found out all of this great information. And so what, why do we need to investigate this site further? So early sites along the, the Oregon coast. Oh, oh whoops, whoops, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself here. So why do we even need to research this site any further? So my, my research is focused on uh, peopling of the Americas and evidence of Oregon's earliest inhabitants. And so the archeological record from the first Americans is known from a handful of sites, almost exclusively from the interior away from the coastal margin. And the latest research posts uh, points to a coastal migration from Eastern Beringia. An early archeological record along the Oregon coast remains poorly understood due to the paucity of early sites. Um, and there's, several reasons for this, why we are lacking sites that range 12,000 to 8,000 years old, or really before 4,000 years old. Um, and I'll go over that in just a moment. But what do we know about um, Oregon, uh, coastal archaeology? So the archaeological record and the ethnographic record point to a thriving native population beginning mid to late Holocene and into historic times. Much of the research that is going on now has been done under the assumption early peoples were utilizing the coast in the same way as they were during historic time when we have actual like written accounts of how people were utilizing the coast. Um, so we know that archeological sites should be there, but, but why can't we find them? This is a fundamental problem in coastal archeology span when we're talking specifically about late Pleistocene, early Holocene sites. When I say late Pleistocene, you can think of this uh, often, you know, you, the last ice age. So the transition from the ice age into uh, the Holocene time, which we're in now. Um, just to come back here uh, and kind of hone in here. So most of these really old sites that we do find in Oregon and in Western US uh, are, are here located on the interior. So um, Paisley Caves here in Oregon, uh, Cooper's Ferry, which is not on this, but uh, is also uh, a pretty old site located in central western Idaho. Um, we've got the Butter Buttermilk Creek Complex in Texas. All of these are, you know, 14,000, 15,000 years old. So these are the types of sites that we're looking for when we're looking for uh, evidence of the first peoples in the Americas. Okay. So going back to, we know sites should be there if, if we assume that there's a coastal migration route um, into the Americas, but why can't we find these sites? So the most obvious reason is that uh, sea level fluctuations since the last ice age, if you can imagine a, you know, let's go back here, uh, you know, a, a ice sheet that can cover Canada, all of that water has to go somewhere. So when things are, when all of this water is taken from the ocean and locked up into these big, you know, uh, ice sheets, all that water is displaced. So as things start to warm, uh, sea level, it rises over time. So sea, le sea level rise, sea levels have been steadily rising over the last 20,000 years. 
Um, and this is either destroyed or obscured landforms that would have been available for use by early peoples. And this continues to be a problem with rising sea levels. And with rising sea levels, we also have um, coast like erosion, things like that. So archeological sites don't really uh, stand a chance to mother nature. And this uh, photo here is, um, has since been refined since I pulled this for my thesis, but uh, can you guys see that zoomed in here? But just to, let's see, up, up, up. here's Tackenich Lake here. Um, and what all of these lines represent are the, the sea level or the shoreline at 20,000 years, we have 14,000 years, 13,000 years, 12,000 years, 11, 9, 7, 6. And so it really starts to stabilize at around 6,000 years before present. So at the time, you know, if we're looking for sites that are anywhere between 8 and, you know, say 20,000 years old, most of this is now underwater. So um, as this is fundamentally one of the biggest problems archaeological archaeologists face when searching for early sites along the coast. So how does uh, sea level fluctuation influence the environment? Specifically, you know, uh, let's go here. Um, so there's this concept known as environmental facies shift. So if we look at this uh, diagram here, we've got the late Pleistocene, late Pleistocene environmental facies. So uh, here's the shore. We've got the littoral environment and estuarine environment, this coastal plain, uh, which would have been available for use by people living um, along the coast at the end of the Ice Age or at the late Pleistocene, early Holocene. Um, and then we've got the alluvial valleys and uplands, and then montane and headwaters. So as sea level begins to rise, basically all of these facies shift. So uh, what, you know, the mar this maritime environment um, is broadened, I mean, just for the scale, but uh, the littoral estuary and coastal plain, everything kind of gets cinched together. Um, and that space that would have been available for use at the late Pleistocene is now either you know, underwater or only <laughs> present, there's some overlap. And so we look for these places um, as potential landforms or when you, when you do have these remnant coastal plains or these remnant landforms that would have been available to use in, from the late Pleistocene but are still um, visible today, those are areas we should, should be looking in. So the question of where are archaeological sites um, that date to the late Pleistocene, early Holocene, you know, it becomes a fundamental a, a, a geology problem, essentially. You're looking at, you're looking for landforms that would have been available um, for people to use during this late Pleistocene, um, early, early Holocene, transition that should say uh, early hall or no no that's right correct sorry criticizing my own diagrams here <clears throat> so in addition to this sea level fluctuation there's also some other factors that we have to consider that influence archaeological sites on the coast um, so geography and associated geology so this has to do with um, preservations, just basically where things are in the landscape, uh, climate, soils, the types of soils archaeological sites are, are buried in, if you will, um, and then the choices people make. So what kinds of tools are they using? What kinds of materials are they making uh, tools with? So these can be perishable materials versus stone, um, and then where people decide to set up camp, where people decide to you know, more use one place more intensely than another. So these are all kind of factors that we have to consider when we're looking for these early sites. Um, all of these ultimately influence the distribu distribution, preservation, and visibility of archaeological sites in the landscape. I should note here, this is a pretty, uh, uh, a, a point to take home is that here on the Central Oregon coast, we don't have 
uh, an abundance of raw lithic materials. And so people were often using perishable materials for, um, for tools or everyday items. And these do not preserve well on the Oregon coast because we have pretty acidic soils. And so what makes Tackenich really unique is that the Sheldman actually uh, alters the alkalinity of the soil. And so it kind of helps lend to that, uh, that preservation of perishable materials. So the soil is not quite as acidic, um, leading to preservation or favoring preservation, I should say. So other reasons for very few late Pleistocene, early Holocene archeological sites along the coast um, is because people were uh, under, had more dispersed activities. There were small campsites, not large permanent villages. Um, and then there was, as I mentioned, heavy use of perishable materials. Uh, tools, art, and structural materials are largely made of wood, fiber, antler, bone, and shell materials. Again, do not lend themselves to preservation in uh, acidic soils. We don't see a lot of pottery produced by the tribes along the central Oregon coast. Um, and then preservation bias. Uh, I had just kind of went over this. Middle to late Holocene coastal shelmans preserve per perishable materials by altering the soil chemistry. And these sites are readily visible along the modern coastlines. But many of these site types, specifically during the late Pleistocene, early Holocene sites are now inundated with water and have eroded. So a lot of the shelman sites that are still available or uh, uh, accessible or visible today along the coast are much younger. We typically don't see uh, Shelman sites that are much older than 4,000 years old. Um, and then we don't have a substantial comparative collection of what late Pleistocene, early Holocene terrestrial sites look like. As a result, we don't really have enough information to develop meaningful model models to develop site expectation. What I mean by this is that, you know, when I say terrestrial sites, uh, you know, during the late Pleistocene, early Holocene transition, that, you know, people that would have been living along the coast, those sites would have looked like the Sheldmans we see today. However, at the late Pleistocene, early Holocene at 4,000 years ago, if we go back here, whoops. Uh, they would have been more terrestrial sites. So Takanich is here, um, but at 14,000 years, the coastline is pretty far out. So this would have been a, considered a, a terrestrial site. And that's gonna look a lot different because shellfish isn't readily available at this time. Uh, one, the lake was not there. And two, you're quite a ways away from the shoreline. So we'd be looking at a completely different uh, signature as a relates to the archeological record. Because we don't have a substantial comparative collection, we can only make assumptions of what these sites would look like. Okay, what kind, we can think about what kinds of activities people would have been doing in that area. Hunting, they would have been more um, small campsites. We wouldn't expect to see large permanent villages quite that far inland. And this is purely based on Again, what the archeological record says now, of which we, we actually have a very slim archeological record as it relates to terrestrial sites, even younger archeological sites in the coast range today. Um, and then another reason we don't find a lot of late Pleistocene, early Holocene sites, even terrestrial sites, is because it's extremely dense in the coast range. If you've ever been out there hiking around, you don't you can't really see the ground and so and these things are these areas are uh very difficult to access um so ground cover makes site identification difficult using traditional survey techniques i'll talk about this in just a moment but um i'll talk about the traditional survey techniques um and then a lot of it is accessibility so we know that there are probably larger sites located um, inland in these larger river valleys uh, along the coast range. But a lot of that really nice land, if you think of it nice as in these areas that would hold archaeological sites are owned, uh, they're in private ownership. So we don't, archaeologists, you know, unless somebody's 
invited to come out onto their property, we really don't have access or a reason to do any kind of archaeological survey uh, on private property. And then uh, this also comes down to research efforts. There hasn't been much research conducted in the coast range other than, um, you know, we are required again by law as uh, to consider the uh, um, effect of federal undertakings on cultural resources. And so as you know, when the Forest Service conducts uh, projects in, in the coast range, we have to uh, consider the effects, but uh, again, there's all of these other aspects like dense vegetation. Um, and then, you know, people aren't hanging out on like 50 to 90% grade slopes. So there, anyways, there hasn't been a lot of research conducted in the coast range. Um, so because of all of these factors I mentioned, okay, this makes finding early, uh, you know, late, early archeological sites or late Pleistocene, early Holocene archeological sites along the coast, very difficult. Um, and I wanna hone in here on the methodologies that archeologists have traditionally used to locate archeological sites when we are looking for them in the coast range. So, um, so although it's helpful, we don't need to rely on finding materials on the surface to indicate buried sites in some areas, like I had mentioned, uh, it's not feasible on the coast because of dense vegetation, because of the, of the terrain, things like this. Um, so this traditional method of going out and finding archeological sites, if you think of, if you've ever, you know, if you compare the coast range to somewhere like Eastern Oregon, typically you walk around and you conduct pedestrian survey and you're just looking at the surface and looking for um, cultural remains, whether it be like, you know, stone tools, things like this. It's just not feasible on the Oregon coast. So as a result, we're better suited to use geoscientific techniques to locate dirt of the right age. Um, and this really not only saves time, but time and money, but it helps aid in the management of cultural resources. So I talked about looking, you know, this being a real geologic problem at its core or, um, and it really comes down to that. Because we can't see things on the surface, we need to hone in on landforms that would have the potential to hold old archaeological sites or archaeological sites in general. So I'm not painting a good picture here for the archaeological record along the Oregon coast, but that's not to say that those early sites don't exist. So here's a list of sites along the Oregon coast um, that do date to the late Pleistocene and, and to the early Holocene, essentially greater than 6,000 years before present. So along the southern coast, we have the Devil's Kitchen site, which dates to around 12,000 years before present, Black Lock Point, which dates to around 8,000 years before present, Indian Sands, which dates to around 12,000 years before present. And then on the central coast, we have the Taconich Landing Site, um, dated to around 8,800 years before present. And then Neptune State Park, while not confirmed, it is suspected that there is a 9,000 year old uh, occupation at that site. Okay, so getting down to the nitty gritty here, what were my goals of this research? Um, and it comes back to some issues, um, although I should say they did a great job in the 1980s, giving what, given uh, what uh, tools they had at their disposal we, disposal, we learned a ton from the excavation at Taconich Landing. However, there were some um, key issues that we could maybe resolve. So one, manual excavations could not extend below the water table. So as they were excavating down the site, you know, the excavation is right along the shore, that ground, the, the groundwater level or, you know, is, is right there. So they would excavate down. And even though they were still in Shellman deposits, the, the water would just keep rising. And so they weren't able to reach below the water table. And so in order to enhance our understanding of the site's deposits and gather more information than they could in the 1980s, 
we decided to use new technologies at our disposal, disposal that allowed us to reach below the water table. So we know those older deposits are gonna be at the, at the bottom, but if they were inaccessible, you know, how do we get to those? How can we um, really hone in on those and gain some more information? And then the second issue was cultural deposits were classified on the basis or um, of the presence or absence of shell bin materials. So like I had mentioned, if we're focusing on this late Pleistocene, early Holocene occupation, we have to consider what the archeological, uh, what the archeological footprint would actually look like. Would we really be expecting to see Shelvin? No, because this, I mean, we would have expected this, this to be a more terrestrial site. So first of all, we need to ask the question, is there even a potential for earlier occupation? in previously unexplored areas. So if we're just looking for Shellman, we of course, I mean, we're not really looking for these older deposits. We're just looking for this specific, very obvious cultural signature. Um, and so we're looking to develop, okay, well, what do these deposits look like? What do these late Pleistocene, early Holocene deposits look like? We really haven't done much exploration on identifying those along the coast. And so, this research is kind of contributing to that larger body of knowledge of like, okay, what do late Pleistocene, early Holocene uh, deposits, or what does that dirt look like? Is there a specific characteristic of it that we need to be looking for? And this helps us when we're um, conducting any kind of, I mean, even developmental projects, we say, okay, yeah, even though we don't see an obvious cultural signature, we know what these deposits look like. And this is important because um, you don't wanna be excavating in dirt that's like 50,000 years old, right? At this point in time, we don't have the evidence that people were living here at 50,000 years ago. Um, and that's just, you know, who knows if that will change in the future. I mean, that's the beauty of science, right? Um, okay, so what did we find? Um, I mean, in a nutshell, okay, I guess I should focus on how, how are we going to solve these questions? And I mentioned again, I mentioned before, and I'll say it again, this becomes a kind of a, a, a geoarchaeological approach. So we used this uh, machine called a geoprobe. It's a, core, it's, a, it's a direct push coring rig that takes samples um, and they're encased in this plastic tubing. And so what we decided to do is we sampled across the site um, and beyond the site boundaries in 22 locations um, in designated zones, which I'll show you in just a moment. And each hole produced intact three, three and a quarter inch diameter cores at five foot intervals. So, or about 1.49 meters. So this is a, a core that we took from the site. Um, here, you can see very clearly that uh, the shell midden, um, and then the dirt above and below. But it's really nice because we get these, basically you can think of, you know, holding a straw and putting it in water, pulling it out, and you're getting these really nice intact piece, pieces of um, the earth. And here's what that geoprobe looks like. I'm okay on time. Uh, here's myself labeling cores. Um, at the shore of Takanich. Um, and here's a photo of us taking cores from uh, a, on top of one of the larger hills at the site. Um, it's a pretty, pretty neat piece of equipment. Uh, what happens is they, they push down a casing first. It's called a dual tube method. Push down casing and then so that you shore up the, the borehole uh, walls and then you're able to push down again and actually extract these cores. Um, I should note that this is also much less invasive than an archaeological excavation. So it really depends on the types of research questions you're after. This was sufficient and very quick. Um, archaeology is inherently very destructive. Once we open up large excavation units, all of that information is um, obviously we're analyzing uh, or we're trying to get gain more information, but once everything's excavated, you can't necessarily put it back in context. So this is a little bit less invasive. And for our research purposes, this was very sufficient. We were actually able to get below the water table here. You have to move very quickly 
because the holes do start to fill up with water, but we're able to get down a little bit below the water table. So when we pulled up some of these samples, these cores were full of water, um, which <laughs> was kind of messy. Um, so here's what the coring looked like. So uh, here's the main, main site. Here's the site boundary is this um, blue area. And then this larger area yellow. So we said, okay, we're gonna take up to three boreholes uh, within the main portion of the site. And then we're gonna take uh, push uh, approximately seven boreholes in this within this outer site boundaries, and then we were uh, allowed to take up to tw twenty bore twenty cores or push twenty boreholes um, on the broader landscape. And we developed this with the tribes, um, and you know we figured out okay, you know how how much how much disturbance are we willing to to take and or how much disturbance are we willing to put into the ground <clears throat> to obtain our objectives? Um, and then this is what the final picture looked like. So the green here is the site boundaries. And then all of these little purple dots are where we took cores from around the site. So this is what it looked like when we were finished. Um, here's a photo of you know, on site, you label them right there. We didn't open them in the field. Uh, we opened them in a very controlled environment back at Oregon State University. Um, huh, so daunting to look back at all this. It's like, oh, opening all of these cores and um, basically describing them. So I have to, you have to go through, I went through each one of these and opened them, described them, uh, assigned, um, levels, if you will, we'll go into that in a little bit. Um, so, so what's the point of all these cores? So what we were really trying to do is compare our results with the original excavation. So they had these really nice profiles drawn up in the report. Um, so here's each of these are these one by one meter excavation units. Um, and these are all the different strata that they identified. Uh, so we've got, you know, various shell midden, um, zoom in here, might make it easier. Uh, and then where they found things as they were excavating. So there's some fire cracked rock here. Um, they've got some like charcoal whalebone. I mean, the resolution here is really hard to see, but this gives us an idea of what the excavation actually looked like. So what we wanted to do is get as close to the original excavation with our coring rig to take cores to see if we could basically take a slice of this. Okay, you know, I think the oldest, the older deposits that were like 8,000 years came from this area here in excavation unit P. So we're trying to get close here. Okay, we want it. We want to know what this 7,900 year old dirt looks like. That was our that was our goal. And we were able to actually let's see accomplish that. So here's a core that we took directly right next to uh, the original excavation. So and we compared all of these layers as to the ones that they described in the original excavation, um, which was pretty neat because we were able to take a little sample of their excavation without having to open up another excavation to see, you know, the larger picture. We were able to take a little, a little core from within the site and see what they saw in the 1980s, which is pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, so here we've got the surface deposits, um, the shell mitten, which define the site boundaries, and then there is a non-shell bearing cultural deposit, and then this sterile sand, which they often referred to. So this right here is what we were after. Okay, we know that there wasn't uh, that, you know, 8,000 year old uh, deposit wasn't, had some shell in it, but it wasn't as dense because it, I mean, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, the environment would have been a lot different. They would have been utilizing the site differently um, and not so focused on shell or uh, shellfish as a, a primary source of substance. Um, and then 
I mentioned we had to go through and I opened up all of these cores and described them. So um, this might be a little technical and not that exciting for some of you, but um, here's an example that core that I mentioned, and this is actually two stitched together. Um, so what we did is I described them, compared it with what I, Topol and Miner uh, described and their original excavation. And we actually took dates as well to so say, oh yeah, is this, is this strata LU4, does that correlate to the same as their, what they call what they called 2B? Um, and that's just an identifier for the cultural strata. Um, but we took dates and they lined up really well with what they found. So um, these ones here with the star um, are dates that they obtained. And then we compared those with uh, my descriptions and, and here's a date that we obtain and everything really fit nicely. So, okay, this helps us say, okay, this is definitely not uh, disturbed. We have in context deposits. So we have starting at 3000, you know, as you go deeper in the soil profile, dirt should be older down at the bottom. The old, you know, the oldest dirt is at the bottom, if that makes sense, pretty straightforward. Um, and then here's another, another core, um, which I think is kind of interesting. They also described this layer of very dark, rich dirt that didn't really have shell in it, but it was still a, a cultural. This is pretty classic midden, um, pretty classic midden. It's very dark in color. It's almost like smudgy, smeary. It just has to do with a lot of the organic, organics that they would have been using um, decaying at the site. But as we go down, this is pretty interesting. We're finding some really, we're getting some really old dates here. And 36,000 year old dirt uh, is pretty uncommon to find along the coast. Um, these landforms, again, are usually underwater or inaccessible really to us. And when I say us, um, I guess I should say it's inaccessible in the sense that Archaeologists don't typically work on these landforms that are um, uh, being considered for investigations, if you will. You know, it's not that these landforms don't exist, but a lot of these um, prop, uh, a lot of these landforms or these areas are own, in private ownership, so we don't really have access to these areas. Um, and then here's a couple more. Uh, profiles of the cores. And again, we're getting these 15,000 year old dates. This is a flipped, you know, for various reasons. I'm not exactly sure what happened here, but um, we're getting some really old dates, which is really exciting for us because we're looking for this, you know, 15,000 year old deposits, 15 to 8,000 year old deposits. What do these look like? We don't know. So now we're getting a snapshot into what this looks like. Um, and then here's another one, and this one's kind of exciting. One of the cores taken at the site, the, these 11,000 to 13,000 year old deposits are pretty close to the surface, um, which is very exciting because it means it's really accessible and we might be able to someday open an excavation and try to figure out, is there even archeological deposits associated with these older, um, this older dirt, uh, we don't know, but we know that the dirt's there. And so this comes back to that whole idea of trying to locate these landforms in the dirt of the right age in order to tell us, yeah, there's a potential for uh, uh, early archeological sites. Um, and this is the bare bones, what, what the research came down to. So out of all those cores, I took a cross section um, a a prime or A to A prime, and then B to B prime, um, just to kind of get an idea of uh, the deposits and how they extend across the site. So we have all these cores, we open them up, I describe all the stratigraphy, and we basically connect the dots. So you can think of this as like a little snapshot into the ground, um, and it, it it gives us a model to you know, where these deposits are under the surface. So it gives us an idea of where to focus. Um, 
So here's just the breakdown of one of the transects. Uh, you see these different layers, um, and we really broke these up into different components. Uh, we've got component one and then component two, which is like what they had seen in the in the 1980s. And then we have an older, older component. And that's this, you know, it jumps from between this 8,000 to like 30,000 years. So that's a long time that's missing. Um, and I'll go into that in just a moment. But um, but here we've got this stretch between three to 10,000 years. Um, and I fit in some dates that were taken from the uh, original excavation. But again, this is pretty common that we, we saw across the site. We have this uh, more recent component, which has been disturbed. Um, pretty, it, it's related to historical, historical activities at the site, construction, these kinds of things. And then we have this uh, pre-contact occupation that um, was identified uh, by Miner and Topol. Um, and then it just, we're missing around like 10,000 years, which is pretty, um, it's not unusual for at the coast. This is uh, actually common at the, at the Neptune site too. There's this period where you have these Basically, until twelve thousand, you know, I think twelve thousand years, and then all of a sudden you have you jump to twenty thousand years before present. So, um, the reason why that is, I, I don't know. It's either, you know, there's several different things that could it could be attributed to, um, whether it be stability or erosion, things like that. But we know that there's a, a chunk of time missing here. So. Uh, all of this just comes down to this simple little diagram, right? It's like spend so much time conducting research and I have a diagram to show for it. Um, but again, like the main focus of this research was assessing the potential for an early archeological site at Tackernich Landing. We had that 8,000 year old date to work with. Those dates were really uncommon um, along the central Oregon coast as associated to an archeological site. Um, and so this is the composite that we developed. So here to the right, we've got um, a, a, the composite diagram or the composite profile, um, and that's the sediment or soil profile from the archaeological site. Um, and then this is what I saw, which corresponded very, um, very nicely with their work, actually. Uh, so we have this, can I move this around? Okay, okay. Uh, so I've defined four periods, if you will. We have this like more uh, recent, that is recent, like 3000 to present time. Um, and these look like angular gravel, sand, modern surface, um, some dune sand. And then period three, which was the primary cultural component identified by Miner and Topol. Um, and these are cultural deposits that occurred in Holocene dune sand. And then this older component that is what we were after, this dirt of the this dirt of the right age, this light place, light, late Pleistocene, early Holocene deposit, we identified here is that kind of part of this period three as like the cultural package. Like, okay, we know there's a potential here. Um, and this is characterized by brown sand dominated loamy textured material. Very exciting, I know. But we didn't really see a lot of shell. We didn't see shell in this, but uh, we, we now have an idea of what late Pleistocene, early Holocene deposits look like in this area along the central Oregon coast. Um, and then below that, we've got silt dominated, um, very, very fine materials. Uh, it was a buried paleosol, um, which was kind of, neat. Um, again, very common to see in these uh, um, these older paleosols formed in these Pleistocene aged dunes. If you're inter interested in the uh, development of the dunes, I, I really encourage you to explore Kurt Peterson's work. Uh, he's dated, sourced, 
dunes up, up and down the uh, Eastern Pacific. So it's pr pretty interesting stuff. So what does this tell us? Um, is, so now we know that there's some really old dirt down there. 12 dates collected proved good age depth association, suggesting that there is an intact stratigraphic sequence across the site. And the deposits that we identified date between 42,000 and 3,000 radiocarbon years before present. This is pretty unique because many landforms that would have been exposed during the last glacial maximum or at the end of the ice age um, have been submerged and is, is actively being eroded or is covered with Holocene dune sand. And those are the dune sheets that we see today. Um, and at the very least, we can say that this that at this site, there are deposits that have the potential to hold archaeological relevant material. Um, and this aids in the management of cultural resources in the area. So now if we ever have a project going on in the area, okay, we know what that dirt looks like. We know how old it is. I mean, it gives us, it gives us some, uh, provides us with a really nice management tool. Um, and then what future work can be done at the site? Um, because of the relative ease of access, Takanich Landing provides a unique opportunity to further explore the identified dirt of the right age for cultural occupation. Um, and then areas with comparable characteristics in the vicinity should be evaluated for a similar stratigraphic sequence, such as some property that we own right next door or Silk Coos Lake to the north. So um, areas that are geographically similar, similar um, or, or geologically similar could also be candidates for late Pleistocene, early Holocene sites. Um, and this could have implications for presence of more dirt of the right age further west, but the only problem is, is we've got hundreds <laughs> of feet of sand uh, covering, covering these old deposits. Um, yeah. So that that's concludes my presentation. This was essentially sum up, sum up of my master's work. I'm sure some of you have seen my presentations before, but at least this time I got some new <laughs> figures out of it. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing with us, Molly. We did have some really great questions roll in, so I'm just going to start taking them off here um, in no particular order. Um, first one, are there periods of disruption where human habitation has slowed or stopped that might correspond to the 300 to 500 year earthquakes through the 4,000 year record? Um, I am not aware of an arc. <laughs> I mean, I, subsidence from the geologic perspective, subsidence would definitely alter the visibility of archaeological sites. So I think it's, I, I mean, I, I imagine those larger earthquakes impacts essentially how they look on, the, how archaeological sites are dispersed on the landscape. So it really, I mean, I think it would be, a, again, a geologic question. So look for areas that maybe would have like, like where landslides would have occurred in these larger yeah. river valleys and capped off those sites. Mm -hmm. um, but as it relates to like people just not utilizing an area, I mean, I'm sure that would be, yeah, if a place becomes inundated and no longer accessible as a result of the earthquake. Mm -hmm. I think that's reasonable, but I don't know of any specific examples of that. Okay. Uh, if the coastline was miles away at the time, where, why are so many seashell remains at Takamich? Well, the uh, most intensive period was 5,000 to 3,000 years before present. So the coastline at 5,000 years wasn't much further away than it was now. So sea, lo sea level okay. shoreline stabilizes at around 6,000 years. And so that's, we see that most intense occupation there at the site. The sea, you know, the shoreline really wasn't that far away. And freshwater shellfish are still accessible. Um, right. But it was a slow transition from the uh, estuarine, you know, the brackish water shellfish to the uh, freshwater shellfish. But the coastline really wasn't that far away during mm -hmm. the most intensive period, which is so associated with the shell midden. So 20,000 years ago, how far would the coastline have been out compared to today? Oh, 
I any idea? I gotta look at the scale of this map. Off the top of my head, let's see. So if we're looking at, sorry, I'll do this old school way. Like get, a, <laughs> get a piece of paper here. So we're looking at, so eight, like 16, 16 to 20 miles, I would say. Okay. Wow. Takovich. Wow. Nice. 20,000 years. Wow. Okay. Good to know. Is there a hand auger that might be used? And then another question that can relate to that is, does LIDAR help locate coast range sites? Uh, hand augering? <laughs> uh, you can use hand augers, but it, uh, it really grinds up the deposits. So you, you can use it as a tool to look for um, older dirt. So if you have the eye for it, you can, you know, we, we use it for projects. And in fact, looking at one that was like 15, 15, you know, 15 feet down, which you have all these crazy extensions and it gets really complicated, but you don't get these intact samples. All we're able to see is, oh yeah, we see some pedogenesis or soil formation, which is indicative of stability and um, it kind of triggers us to say, okay, these, these, these deposits look older as opposed to like, you know, beach sand or something like that. So we use it as a initial tool, but if we want to get more control and um, uh, detail, the geoprobe is very effective because it, it allows us to take things out in samples and we can open them and we can preserve them. So it's really mm -hmm. nice if you wanna see things in context. Otherwise, you know, you're talking about like backhoes and trenching. And again, that's really destructive. So this yeah. geo the coring is really the best. If you want a controlled sample um, that shows a really accurate picture of what's below the surface, these, you know, intact samples taken with the geo probe is really the ideal method. And it's much faster than auger probing. So, <laughs> what was the second part of that question? Um, LIDAR, does that, does LIDAR help identify, um, locate those coast range sites? Uh, I use it as a tool to look at topography uh, on the landscape. So, you know, I can see areas that are flatter and then it's also useful again to like look at like previous landslide scars and things like that so it is at lidar i use regularly and mm -hmm. for my job to locate archaeological sites in general old young doesn't matter yeah and then there, there's a question oh. and then there's a question here about how do you date the layers radiocarbon dating is typically okay. what we use okay um, and then what organics would they have been using to produce the very dark soil in the sampling? Uh, just any kind of like plant material, animal materials. I mean, all that stuff breaks down over time. So it's, uh, you know, it's not some a specific okay. material, but it's just, you can think of it like organic material in general. You know, if you're ever digging through a non, you know, not an archaeological site, you, you see like, I mean, if you were to go pull up some of your sod and your grass, like that, it's just that de uh, uh, the decomposing of like the organic matter uh, or decomposition mm -hmm. of the organic matter <laughs> creates this really dark, rich soil. And so it's, it's very similar. It's just people are, are involved. And then we have an audience member who says they found thousands of oyster shells in the dunes just north of the mouth of Silk Coos River. Is this a shell midden and has any research been done in that area? Uh, we've done some research um, and just some surveys and I know some just general surveys, but those oyster shells are actually not shell midden. Um, they're, they're put, they use it, the wildlife folks use it to actually help with the snowy plover and there's a correlation too between like the pink sand verbena and which the snowy plover rely on too but 
Yeah, no, I, before I knew that too, I was out serving and I also stumbled <laughs> across that and I was like, what is this? I, had, didn't, I didn't know that that's what they were doing, but then I kept looking at all the shells and they were just all oyster shells, which yeah. is fact that, I mean, men would not just consist of oyster shells. Right, so, right. Was, mm, what is this? <laughs> so, no, those are not shell middens. Have you seen any seeds in the soils at the early occupation sites? Not from the cores that we took. Okay. We didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't, um, I did screen. So we split the cores in half. I did screen one half to make sure that it wasn't, you know, there weren't any um, kind of like more microscopic, if you will, or, or you know, smaller pieces of flakes or seeds or anything like that, but I did not see any. Okay. But then I, I still haven't screened the whole other half. We're archiving those for future research. Okay, nice. Um, were, the er where, were the early soils occupied by people? We don't know. At this time, we don't know that, we don't know if there is an occupation or not. I mean, again, those samples are really, I mean, for, their tremendous amount of information we can gain from them. We really can't, we didn't see any cultural materials in any of the cores that we took. Okay, okay. And then what, if anything, is found in a non-shell bearing cultural deposit in addition to the decayed organic material? Oh, so, I mean, by identify, I mean, I'd have to go back and read the report to see exactly what was recovered from the non shell bearing cultural strata. So I don't know off the top of my head, like what specifically they found in the 1980s. Okay. Any type, let's see, any DNA analysis that you've done in any of the core samples? No. Okay. But you can, you're preserving them. So who knows in the future, right? What might possibly be able to be done? Yep, that's for some other poor graduate students. <laughs> Can you describe the role of the tribes in this research? So we worked very closely with them because the site um, uh, is listed on the National Reg Register and it's a sensitive, sensitive site for them. I mean, it ha holds a lot of information. So when we were even, before we even, I mean, we had, we worked very closely on developing the research questions. You know, I went, I went and presented, um, to the Kusla Ramkwasa Isla uh, tribes. And then we worked with the Siletz on um, making sure that, okay, are we okay taking cores from, you know, so many cores from within the site boundaries. Um, and they were very involved on the site during the process. And then again, when we were opening the cores, they were there. So they were integral and part of this. Like we, we pitched the idea, you know, uh, addressed any concerns they had and worked closely with them throughout the process and continued to do so. Very good. Um, let's see, did you ever see any shell fragments from the native Olympia oysters in any of the shellfish middens? Maybe, I don't really know what those <laughs> look like. <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm not a shellfish person, so I'm definitely, I mean, you could hand me, I'm like, it's a bivalve. Like that's about my extent of selfish knowledge. That's what I have reference books for. <laughs> and then one last question. Is there any community science opportunities um, in, the, in these areas available? Um, not that I know of right now. Uh, and it's something that we, I, I know that my work partner and I have talked about uh, there are these programs called PIT projects or Passport in Time so that, you know, if we, we've considered doing, um, opening up a small excavation um, at some more accessible sites along the coast, mm -hmm. um, you know, given that we've got the, the time, money and support. Um, but that those types of opportunities, I know not just with like us, but with, I mean, with the site you saw, which we, I mean, we really haven't had an excavation in a really long time. Um, they've been more focused on uh, building restoration, but 
other forests, a national forest, and then like the BLM also has pit projects. So there are opportunities to get some um, excavation experience if that's something that you're interested in. And then um, the Oregon Archaeological Society, OAS, um, it's really volunteer uh, focused group. So if you are interested in learning more about Oregon archaeology and getting involved and volunteering, I would really encourage you to explore that option too. Great suggestions. And then we had several comments come through with thanks to you, Molly. Great presentation. Um, thank you so much again for being here to share your research uh, with us. Really, really appreciate that. Thank you, audience members, for attending. Um, and with that, I hope everybody has a wonderful day and weekend. Have a good Thank one you. all. Bye-bye.